I am impossibly excited today to be interviewing the one and only Stella Duffy, the award-winning writer of 17 novels, 17 novels, I just checked before we went live, over 70 short stories and 15 plays, who's also worked in theatre for 35 years as an actor, director and facilitator. She's a psychotherapist and a yoga teacher. She recently completed or is about to complete, she did, she's nodding, she completed her doctorate in existential psychotherapy and her research was in the embodied experience of post-menopause. We are going to be exploring what that means shortly. She's been post-menopausal since chemotherapy for breast cancer in her mid-30s. She's been active in equalities and diversity work in the arts and LGBTQ plus communities for many decades. She's also a Buddhist I found out this morning <laughs> while I was finally doing my research. What a woman! Welcome, Stella. Thank you, Rachel. That gorgeous to be doing this with you. I love your podcast. I have been listening for ages, so it's yeah, really thrilling to be part of it. Thank you. I'm so pleased we've had, we've struggled to make this happen, haven't we? But we're finally here and we're finally talking. And just before I hit record, we were talking about how we've known of each other and we've interacted on social media for quite some time, but it wasn't until the end of last year that we actually met in person. And we both went, oh my goodness, look, there she is. You know what? There was you and Kate Codrington and I was being... <laughs> Fan girl and too scared to come and say hello to both of you and I thought oh, this is just absurd that you're both brilliant and then you were both really lovely to me and I was like oh thank God I'm in the right place and you I think we were the fan girls <laughs> I mean come on me and Kate were like <laughs> well it is absolutely there was a the joyous event to be there with so many people who are passionate about acknowledging both the need for support in menopause but also. You know, the possibility that menopause isn't the end of our bloody lives. Mm. It doesn't have to be always seen as the most negative thing possible. And from my perspective, given my research, that actually, you know, past menopause is the last third of our lives. It might be a good idea to pay attention to how we're going to enjoy it. Exactly. And you and I have both had interesting and potentially mm -hmm. difficult menopause stories, especially you. And yet we've both reached the conclusion that, as you just said, this is not the end of meaningful life. This is another chapter. And That's great. And you know, for me, because I became menopausal with chemotherapy for my first cancer at 36, um, and this is in 2000, you know, menopause was not on people's telly and promoted by celebrities as, oh my God, here's the worst thing that ever happened to me. And quite frankly... It wasn't the worst thing that ever happened to me. The worst thing that ever happened to me was having chemotherapy that may be infertile just at the part that my wife and I were trying to have children. Now, we were working with um, the fertility unit. We had a baby father. It was all organized. And on the day of my first biopsy, it was the day I was to have had my first insemination. So my menopause coincided with six months of chemotherapy. And I remember I had um, Zolodex injections, which uh, any of you listeners who've had breast cancer well, may well have had or know about, and they're pretty enormous. They they basically shut your estrogen and probably quite a bit of your progesterone up immediately, like within minutes. Yeah. Um, and I left the GP and I had the first of what was a series of about 40 hot flushes in an hour within five minutes of having this injection. And the idea was that it might have protected my um a, a ovarian function during chemo but in the end it didn't and i lost all five embryos uh one after the other inside of me and then they ended up doing quite a lot of work around childless just not my choice and um infertility and i'm very happy to have done that work and pleased that people seek me out for that work so it's not that my menopause wasn't hard. My menopause was incredibly bloody difficult and mm. deeply lonely, given how young I was. Mm. And it, but it wasn't as bad as having my first cancer and looking at my mortality at 36. And it wasn't as bad as having my hopes to be a mother uh, dashed overnight. And so I think what I got, and it is good fortune I got this, 
Well, I got, well, it struck and it did strike overnight. Um, I got some perspective on it because it just wasn't as shit as some of the other shit things. Um, and I, I worry now when I work with um, clients who are struggling with their menopause that our cultural story about menopause is so negative that people are actually getting nervous before they go into it, even before perimenopause. They're beginning to dread it. Um, it could be, you know, be a, like a therapist to know that negativity bias is really strong. Um, and we're dealing with a cultural thing. It's not just an embodied thing. We live in a culture that is ageist, as was sojournist, and despises of women. So, yeah, that's a long-winded answer to it's not that I didn't have a difficult male cause. Um, I did. But there were some other really difficult things going on. And what is very interesting in my research is that the working class women, the disabled women, and the women of colour do note that they have had other really bad things going on. And sometimes the other bad things were just as bad, if not worse. And it meant they didn't pay a great deal of attention to the crap of their menopause. Um, that's not to say that people who are paying attention to the how things of their menopause are getting it wrong. But I do think, unfortunately, some perspective can really help. That is fascinating mm. because, you know, I I've talked to people, white women, mm -hmm. who have spent a lot of time in Africa. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they're kind of like, why are we making such a fuss about this? Yeah. You know, there are women who can't feed their children, yes. you know. Yes. And and it does strike me as a very, certainly here in the UK, um, it's a very white middle class issue. Yeah, I think there's a real problem, and I'm sure this will piss some people off. So, you know, come at me. Oh, let's piss them off. But <laughs> that's what we're here to do, Stella. Come on. <laughs> that you and I, both white women, can utterly acknowledge that white feminism has embodied itself through capitalism and patriarchy. It has said very clearly that what feminism is about is equal pay. Right, I'm not saying that doesn't matter. But Take God, you'd have to have a good job forever to matter because the vast majority of low paid people are women working part time work. So that said, um, and it has also embodied itself in this idea that no problem should ever happen. And that if things are problematic, then we need to fix them and not live through or learn from. And I think that's pretty dangerous. And if you look at other cultures where older women are revered, I had the great good fortune of growing up in small town Aotearoa, New Zealand. And that meant that a lot of the people I interacted with were Maori and Polynesian. And Maori and Polynesian cultures have great respect for older women. And that meant that I understood that we might age and there might be the problems of aging but not necessarily the problems of ageism. And white feminism tells us that nothing ever has to go wrong and all we need to do is throw money at it and then it's going to be better. Um, you know, one of the black women in my research, and I made a real effort to not only research white middle class models, because unfortunately the vast amount of certainly British and North American uh, research into menopause has been on the bodies. I know this is changing, but until recently has been on the bodies of white middle-class mothers. Um, and, you know, we're heading for a time very soon when 35% of women will not be mothers. Quarter is not a small minority. You know, we really need to be addressing this. Um, and... The problems of menopause are to do with ageism. They're to do with misogyny. They're to do with capitalism that says we have to work until we drop. There's to do with the patriarchy that says that we're not valuable unless our uterus is fully functioning and breeding babies. So until we address all of that, it's not good enough to just say, oh, well, I'm fine because I can afford to to pay to go to a private service that's just going to give me drugs to make it better for me. If my menopause is shit, then it's my job to take it on for everyone else too, thank you. Boom. <laughs> yeah. 
Absolutely. Oh, isn't this so exciting though? Because you and Aline met at an event with the UCL with Joyce Harker's team of people who are extremely diverse, who want yes. to make a difference. None of us have got stories of, oh, I sailed through it. Mm. All of us have got stories of other problems, other life difficulties, of meeting Danny Biddington, who, who does menopause and hand so, you know, who, who has a similar story, but different, obviously, to mine, because we all have different stories. You know, there's a lot of people who are interested in, well, if I've got to make this better for me, who else can I make it better for? And how else can we support Pick Service isn't just a, you know, Pan Alpha's work around in, including black women in the menopause story. Um, the importance of this not being yet another white women's crusade is so enormous. And I'll add, not just another straight white women's crusade. Yes. Because so often um, menopause research hasn't included us queer women. Mm. And, you know, what is so interesting is that, well, trans men menopause, you know, <laughs> and non-binary people menopause. And, and all of us can learn from each other. And I think that what we're missing when we only stick to our, um, our, our, our sort of, you know, traditional groupings of here's the white middle-class women. And I grew up working class poor, but of course I'm living a very privileged middle-class life now. I've worked in the arts for decades. I could have afforded to otherwise. Um, I couldn't have afforded to go back to training at 55 for my psychotherapy training otherwise, but I couldn't afford that training in my 20s. I had to get to 55 before I could afford it because of my background. And I don't know to be making change and leaving my sisters behind, my actual sisters and my sisters in working class upbringing, my sisters in queerness, my siblings in queerness. The change exists, it needs to be changed for all of us. And the existing narratives don't do us any good at all do they? They don't empower any women. So if we are taught that like a third of our lives is uh, irrelevant because yes. the norm, the ideal is a reproductive female. Mm -hmm. And therefore, when we're no longer reproductive, no. which is potentially a third of our lives, uh -huh. plus there's the bid up to puberty when we yes. weren't reproducing, it's a massive part of our lives. And that is irrelevant. Totally. You know? Totally. So, okay, so I've got a, a thing here where um, this story about the estrogen deficiency. <gasps> I'm saying that nine year old girls are an estrogen deficiency. No way not. Of course. Of course we're not. That would be absurd. Are we saying that 33 year old women are who get breast cancer and it's an estrogen hormone receptor breast cancer? Are we saying they're in estrogen excess? Probably not. So why are we talking about menopause as if it's a deficiency disease? Well, I know why, because of Robert Wilson's book and because of the people who've used that to market well, it's, it's yeah. money, isn't it? It's the, it's it's the monetization of menopause, totally. But because, of course, capitalism needs there to be a problem that the market can then fix, and we need to perceive it as a problem. Now... According to the global research, there's over a hundred symptoms that we could look at. I mean, there's, you know, we tend to talk about 34 in Britain. But according to globally, there's over a hundred. But there's also plenty of cultures where those, the symptomology is, is welcomed. So Highland Mayan Guatemalan women, for example, uh, call their hot flushes the rising of the Annan spirit. And instead of going, oh, dear God, I'm so embarrassed, this is awful, how terrible, they're just as we could choose to do at puberty and our first period, for example, there is a choice to welcome this because it initiates us into the beginning of a transition into the next phase of our lives. So I agree with you that it's magnificent. I just have to take a little issue with midlife. Rachel. And it's it's always midlife and beyond. <laughs> oh, I promise. Oh, it, it it's because I can't keep putting midlife and beyond. I believe you. Although midlife and beyond, like a superhero, <laughs> right? It's quite a nice idea. Um, because the thing is, globally, menopause happens at forty eight, and in Britain, it's the fifty one quick fire. But darling, none of us are going to be one hundred and three. 
thank God. But um, we will be. We, it, it's not we'll, that yeah, long we'll, until we'll we will be. Those of us who've had two cancers and an aneurysm won't. <laughs> But the, so the thing that I am interested in is that if we genuinely approach menopause as either the middle of that adult life, so say you've been an adult from 20, 18, 20, um, to whatever, 48, and you've got another half of your adult life, or the last third of our full life, let's find what's our value in it. Because from a so, so from an existential psychotherapeutic point of view, and the reason I work quite a lot with people with cancer, with infertility issues, um, with big difficult things going on in their lives, not that you know the ordinary relationship stuff aren't difficult, of course they are, but when it feels out of our control, like embodied things, in existential work, we don't want people to only look for the positive. We absolutely encourage them to acknowledge how hard it is to feel into from a very embodied perspective what it is like to be being in this state so from my perspective what it was like to be being someone with cancers what it was like to be being treated for cancer other than doing it being it mm. and also from a menopausal perspective what it is like to be being in menopause and in postmenopause because we all won't pretend that those things haven't happened or that we're not living them. But as well as that, what we want to look for is, and where is the value here? Where is the meaning? What is this, what is, what is this opening in my life that might not otherwise have opened? So I think, you know, for a lot of us, it can feel like being hit by a truck when our bodies stop doing what we tell them to. Um, and I think, you know, this is also part of the story of puberty. And if we would allow that menopause is just a reverse puberty, then we would remember that we've been through it once. And for those of you who've had children, pregnancy is a major life transition. Becoming a mother from being a not mother is a major life transition. If we could remember, well, that was a life transition and I lived through it, not for a moment suggesting it's easy. You know, if only we would let the parents of newborns be allowed to admit out loud how bloody hard it is instead of having to go around going, oh, it's changed my life and I've never loved so much. That too is true. But yeah, so hard. Um, and similarly, actually, I would say that uh, coming to terms with one's infertility is also a major life transition. If we would allow ourselves to acknowledge these are major life transitions and we've had practice at it, by the time we come into perimenopause, it would be really okay to go, huh, okay, so what can I remember from my puberty? What do I remember from becoming a mother, becoming a not mother? What do I remember from the first big love relationship or the first big breakup? Things where I felt out of control in my body, my body has gone ahead and made its changes, the illness. And how can I apply that to this? How can I previous learning, rather than disregarding all of our previous learning, how can I bring the person I have become now at 48, 55, whatever, to bear on this version of myself? And I, I fear that when we say menopause is the end of our lives and it's all downhill from here, we denigrate who we've been in the past. We deny our previous strengths. Um, the other thing I really think is important to say is that even if it's, it's at globally, menopause is at, at 48, and perimenopause is 7 to 10 years either side, it would be really good if we stopped telling women in their 40s that they were young to be in her in the course be really helpful because we all feel a bit lonely when our bodies change on us and it would be really nice not to feel quite so lonely but the other thing that would be to stop bringing quite such a western perspective for a great deal as a gay born majority menopause is freedom from unwanted pregnancy and when we go on and on about how terrible it is, we are denying the truth of women who have been forced into pregnancy, forced to keep babies they didn't want, forced to have no autonomy over their bodies from, you know, late childhood. So it's really important to remember, yes, we live in this culture, but other cultures are affected by this too. 
And in other cultures where, you know, for example, Muslim cultures, when a woman goes through menopause, she has more freedom. Ah. Uh -huh. There's a fantastic, I'm actually going to look it up. So if your listeners hear me going click, click, it's because I just want to look up the paper. Uh, the paper is by, I mean, I'm sure it's by Amini et al. I'm going to look that. We there you go. Amini and McCormick. It's, it's 2021. Amini oh. and McCormick and it's older Iranian Muslim women's experience of sex and sexuality. It is such a good paper. Oh, brilliant. Many of the women talk about being free from um, pregnancy and what a great relief that is. Some of them talk about how they had better sex post-menopause because for the first time in their lives, they were able to have a conversation with their husbands where sex did not imply procreation. So I think it's that is also really, we can learn so much from other cultures who are having a different experience of menopause than we are. So much. Absolutely. And what worries me is that the UK is viewed as being so forward thinking. I know. And other cultures are now, other countries and other cultures are adopting what we've been doing. And mm -hmm. I'm going, please don't, or yeah. please think twice, thrice, four, yes. five, six times before you adopt anything. Absolutely. Just, you know, take your pick of what we're doing well, but don't take what we're doing really not, not so well. Um, it's just been a high scene. Maybe because I've read piece, you and have Lowell Cooper and um, that tour in New Zealand on Instagram or whatever. But I've seen quite a few Australian women say, oh, I wish we had the support that British women do. And I'm thinking, so what about the thing is Aboriginal women do? There's your, there's your secret. There's your learning. What, what, the, what, what do the women of the land understand menopause to be? And what have they previously, before white colonisation, understood menopause to be? Because that would be the understanding that comes from the climate, it comes from the diet, it comes from the land, and it comes from understanding where you physically are. Because our embodiment is all about how we are also in place what our land is like, what it is like to live here, what our weather is like and how it affects us. Um, yes, I worry very much that, that we're seen as a bit of a beacon and the beacon is very, very biomedically focused. Um, and you know, I'm somebody who's, who's probably alive because of chemotherapy. I am certainly not someone who denies the value of the biomedicine. But menopause is a biomedical, psychosocial, spiritual experience. And we cannot divorce it from the sociocultural because we live in a culture, we live in a society, in every family group, in every, you know, I mean, single women. How, how badly are single women served by the current discourse? Um, Every combination that we find ourselves, we are part of society and culture. So we cannot treat menopause as if it is merely biological. It reminds me what you're saying of something I've talked about on here before. Um, there's a study quoted in the Slow Moon Climbs. You've read that, I'm guessing. Yeah, yeah. I love that book. And um, she writes about some Mayan women Mm -hmm. who were researched and they were researched by I believe if I'm remembering this correctly an Ethiopian researcher mm -hmm. who didn't come with any preconceptions mm -hmm. about menopause at all and when what she went in and researched she asked them if when when um let's get the wording right when they when they stopped menstruating did they notice anything else? And so she didn't tell them that there were 34 <laughs> symptoms that they needed to be looking out for. Mm. She just said, when you stopped menstruating, did you notice anything else? And the answer was, I stopped getting pregnant. Yeah. yeah. And that was it. So in fact, you know, in some parts of the world, there's only one symptom of menopause. Yes. <laughs> you, you stop menstruating. Yes. Oh, and a second one, you stop getting pregnant. So there's been some amazing studies. I have to cut the arm on now. There's been some amazing studies 
on menopause. And um, in Mayan women, is it there? Okay. Uh, it's by Bayen and Martin. It's 2001, and it's menopause experiences and bone density of Mayan women in Yucatan, Mexico. So they did a whole, I mean, this is very full on. This is FSH levels. This is all the blood tests. This is bone scans. This is the lot. And they compared them against um, United States women and these Mayan women from Yucatan, Mexico. Both showed the same osteoporosis in the bones. But mine women had no fractures. No fractures. That's no bone so fractures. I suppose like to show up for decades, right? If you could have a fracture 20 years ago, it will still show up on a bone stone. One of the reasons they think they had no fractures is that these women are walking up to two miles a day there and back to carry water to the frops. So they are exercising well into their 70s. And they have always exercised and they have always been physical and needed to use their bodies. They think perhaps there's also stuff that um, uh, body mass index declines with age. They think there's also perhaps stuff around having good diet from childhood. So it's great when we change our diets when we need to as adults, but good diet, diet from childhood makes a massive difference. Oh, and they hardly ever drank alcohol. Yes. <laughs> so if they could afford but they probably didn't have much sugar either refined uh, sugar I, and they probably I, don't don't have um hormone hormones in their yes. meat products exactly so what i so i mean what i may think is so important because part of the big push to get us all taking drugs in menopause is that it will save the NHS in 20 or 30 years' time. When it is a load of bollocks! I don't know. <laughs> apparently you all have osteoporosis, broken bones and dementia. Yes. Yes. And, and diabetes and... Yes, the everything. brutality of that story that makes our ageing our problem and, and our hormones problem rather than just a thing that humans do and that if we don't take the drugs, then we are causing a problem. Yeah. That is the underlying theory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As, as, we, we are responsible. Totally. And my wife takes HRT. I'm not an MHD. Sorry, I shouldn't call it HRT. It's not replacing anything. It is a hormone therapy that is not replacing anything because it's not there. See, so you're not replacing it. Um, she found it useful, and that's fine. I get that for some people it is enormously useful. What is problematic is, is the story that it's useful for all of us, and those of us who've had breast cancer find it very, very disturbing that some people with quite a strong public platform are saying, oh, it's fine, go ahead, go ahead. Well, now breast cancer surgeons and oncologists are saying, please don't. Please take care of yourself. Please don't. I personally prefer to listen to the specialists um, and I understand that for some others it feels too hard but one of the reasons it feels too hard is because what being told it feels hard yeah. and bad and that it's wrong and that you are causing a problem for the future if you don't take drugs now. And I, I, I find it's it so shocking. It, I find it so disturbing. I, I really do. It. I just, and the fact that, you know, we're all supposed to take it forever now. I mean, it's I know. just, you know, it's like <laughs> a, a, a woman is innately compromised post menopause. Yeah. They, we are innately faulty. We, so, our bodies go wrong. Mm -hmm. And what, what the value here, I think, in connecting communities is that the childlessness community, that childlessness not by choice, because I understand it's different for child-free people, although still problematic in a pro-natal culture. Um, the childlessness community has worked on this for a very long time. We have worked on understanding our value outside of our procreative ability. We have worked on understanding our value outside of a pro-natal culture that tells us we're not graduate women because we're not mothers. And we have worked on understanding that not everything that we were told is correct about our value and i really think the menopause community and the childlessness community could do some getting together here mm. because i i think that those of us who've been working with it for decades have quite a lot to share about how we came to terms with this because our culture is it's just crap to us when we don't or can't have children mm. it really 
Which is so weird, because at the same time, it's telling mothers that they're shit and they've got it wrong all the time. Right? Well, women are just wrong. Uh -huh. Full stop, aren't they? In, in our patriarchal yeah. culture, women are wrong. Yes, and I'll add to that, so are trans and non-binary people. Right? Anybody who's not a cisgender man has got it wrong. And part of the horribleness that the story that we have to maintain our fertile value is that therefore we only fit with the cliche of the cisgender man. And that's not fair on the men either. So yes, and I would add to that that because trans men, non-binary people, um, menopause too, that all of us are affected by this. In fact, the only people who are really not affected are the cisgender, menopause, able body, big privileged white men. Which is the, that's the actual minority, you know? When the rest of us get together, the minority is the ones that we've always treated as the norm. And those of us who'd be othered consistently by a culture that, that norms the rich white man, where would majority? We see us behave a bit more like we're the majority. And we're the important majority. Well, you see, I think <laughs> what's really, what's, because, if I can be thinking about how we make the change from from those of us who are sort of feel a little bit on the outside going, look, it's not only biomedical, please can you listen to us? We're talking about a more holistic approach. We're, we're keen to embrace our aging, to value ourselves as we become old and older. Um, and I think the way we do it is rather than say, oh, you're not listening to us, this is frustrating and awful, or why are you not, or, you know, make it problematic for us so that we feel like we have to fight is that we do it by basking in it you know by just bloody glorying in presently and despite all the problems i am far happier to be 60 than i was to be 40. i am far happier to be 60 than i was to be 20. they were bloody difficult for all sorts of reasons and that shows up in my post-menopause research a lot. That yes, the menopause transition can bring some difficulties. At the same time, like any transition, it opens new possibilities. And being well into those new possibilities now, having gone to university at 55 and got a doctorate and discovered I like academic stuff and loving being a therapist and still writing a little bit, I'm I'm really excited about what these possibilities give me. And there's a lovely bit in, in my research where one of the women says, she's um, 64, and she says, look, I know that right now I'm probably in my prime. And I know that maybe in 10 years' time, my health or his health, talking of her husband, may deteriorate. One of us might not be here, but I want to really enjoy where I am now. And I think there is something really important about those of us who are enjoying where we are now, getting our voices out there and being as much of a beacon as we can. Because if all we're doing, I mean, this is this is all of your work, Rachel. This is you know, it's why you called the podcast magnificent, right? <laughs> this is the whole point of it to to celebrate this transition into another version. A, a more full, perhaps, version, a new version, but whatever the version is of who I've been becoming all along. I think authentic is a good word to add yeah. to that because I just feel I'm becoming more authentically mm. me. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that we don't really talk about yeah. because when we don't have the hormonal cycles every month, we're different. We are different when we don't have so much estrogen, mm -hmm. which I like to call the nurturing hormone, whether or not we have children, it's designed to do a certain thing. Mm. Um, we are different. And, mm. and we've been taught to see that as something wrong yes. instead of seeing it as something really powerful. And, and you talk about, you know, that we're frightened of the anger. Um, and yet that anger, the flip side of anger is passion. Totally. And then when we're passionate about things, then we do speak up. And yes. it's about bloody time that yes. we did because the world needs us to. Well, a past fact didn't end in South Africa by sitting down and saying, please. It ended by 
again, she started, Nelson Mandela started with violent action, with really strong action. And yes, brilliantly, he turned that round into peace and the generosity of the truth and reconciliation movement. But on the other side of anger is justice, mm. you know? And, and I would also add that there are other things that we, that we are a little frightened of addressing. So again, in our culture, we're told we're not allowed to be jealous, we're not allowed to be envious. There's no point in having regrets. You know, you're supposed to end your life with no regrets. Oh, piss off. <laughs> so if you got to 60 and had no regrets, then have you ever really pushed the boat out? It's okay to regret things. It's okay to look back and go, huh, I missed that chance. Or, shit, what if I had? You know, what if is fine, because what it does, well, the anxiety that we ever feel about any of this does is it gives us a clue to what we want. Our jealousy is fantastically useful for our creativity. It points us in the direction of what we're after. And, you know, we also live in a culture that tells us that anxiety and depression are wrong bad, and we shouldn't feel them. And if we do, we want to get rid of them as soon as possible. Or well, maybe you're depressed because you're really bloody exhausted. Or maybe you're anxious because you're so tired of holding down your anger. Or maybe it's just really hard looking after kids who are 21 and 22 and have had to move home because they can't move out because there's no money. And your ageing parents. And all I said to her for her dying mother for nine years, throughout her 50s and into her 60s, it was exhaustion. Maybe it's tough being us, and maybe it's okay to say so, because when we say so, then we make space for the joy. We make space for going, and now I've said so, what does that care for me? Now I've felt and raged my anger, what do I do with this energy? Can I turn it to some creative thing for me? And by creative, I don't mean writing novels. I mean, sure, if you want to. <laughs> I mean, planting some bloody hyacinths. I mean, looking around your space in which you live and wondering if it was made for you or if it was made for those kids who've left home, come back, left home, come back, make it for you. I mean, treating yourself. Oh, makes me want to cry. Treating yourself with the value you deserve to. You know, we just had a 10 day holiday, my wife and I. We've been together for 33 years. And because of finances and because I didn't grow up with much money and her family are an immigrant family, they moved here from Kolkata when she was two. We've, we've never, ever had long holidays. You know, we've gone away for a week every now and then. And then because she was caring for her mother, we didn't leave Britain um, since 2017. So long before COVID, we weren't going to the warm places. And we just had a 10-day holiday. And it was the most glorious thing. And I came back thinking, oh, I'm allowed that. You know what? I'm allowed that. And letting us, and for others, you know, maybe you can't ever afford a 10-day holiday. But maybe you're allowed a half hour off. You know, maybe you're allowed to put your feet up for a little bit. It's that, and that's not stupid bubble bath me time self-care. That's which is just rubbish and more bloody capitalism. That's what do I want? And what do I want is two questions. One is, what do I want? Not my mum, my dad, my kid, my sister, my brother, my partner, the person I believed I needed to be, but the one I am now. What do I want? What do I want? What's juicy? What excites me? What thinking about it? feels like really good sex yeah what do i want and then using whatever time we have left to begin to make that a possibility for ourselves not all of us will achieve it some of us will die beforehand some of us will get incapacitated beforehand but menopause is just the best wake-up call to our mortality oh yeah totally you no know? it, it, totally. it says you are aging and you will die. And you've got less time left than you've already had. Exactly. It's... The clock is counting down. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. We're so lucky. Our bodies do that for us, mm. whether or not our heads are ready. Mm. 
you know i think it's an incredible gift actually i really do i mean i know some people think i'm you know stop raving mm -hmm. mad to think this <laughs> Just but it, it really it was such a gift and even coming so much earlier than i expected in a way it was a gift because it meant by the time you know my friends are there i've already you know been grappling with this for nearly a decade yes. you know and you're right about it having been a really lonely time it was a really lonely time um but you know i learned from it mm. and and i feel like i've got a head start <laughs> <laughs> totally. totally. And there's something interesting about the loneliness. There's, a, there's another study. I mean, God, I've read maybe, I don't know, 250 or papers. There's a great study, and it's American women, and they interviewed women in their 50s and then mothers in their 70s. And the women in their 50s said, why didn't you tell me about it? And the women in their 70s said, I did, but you were in your 30s and you didn't want to listen. And when people say to me, oh, my mother didn't talk about it, my answer is, did you ever ask? Mm. Because sometimes we have to take responsibility, including in our 20s and 30s, which goes back to where we started, that we need to be very careful what we're telling younger women, our daughters, our young trans and non-binary kids. We need to be careful that we're not telling them this is going to be the worst time in their lives. And that's why, as again, where we started, this new national education program will be so important it's so and why it's so exciting and that we get to younger women and that mm -hmm. now, finally, menopause is on the national, as you know, curriculum in the UK so that, you know, girls, you know, biology biology education yep. doesn't end with pregnancy well there's yes, quite a bit more extra normative anyway i know <laughs> i know oh here's a good one did you know that the term vaginal atrophy actually means the ability of a giant of a vagina to um hold an erect penis Yes, that medical term is basing our female cisgender female bodies on male biology well, I read, God, that's disgusting. I don't know if this is true, but I read that the Latin word vagina means yeah. a sheath. Or wound. Or wound, mm -hmm. does it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but therefore it's a sheath for yeah, a male it's a thing penis. to hold a penis. Yeah, it's a thing yeah. to hold a penis. It's yes. like... <laughs> I know. So again, in the research, there's such interesting stuff around um, long-term lesbian relationships. And yes, our bodies change at menopause. That's right, they do. Um, and women saying, well, we were used to talking about sex. You know, again, I think the menopause community has a lot to learn from the queer community. I think we do too. <laughs> I really think we do too. I agree with you on that one. So that's a book for you to write, please. Will you write that one? <laughs> Childless and lesbian stories for the menopause community with Aunt Brilliant. Duffy. <laughs> we need it. It'd be like, it'd be like, you know, there, there are books out there, aren't there? Um uh lessons for women from queer men yeah well we we need we need the other version you please you, 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 you just... for postmenopausal women uh -huh. thank you very Absolutely. much it's like sure if what you love is penis and vag in vagina sex it might become a little more difficult when your vagina is drier than you're used to well hello. But then you get creative don't here's, you here's Luke, the thing. His hand here's all sorts of other parts of the body yes. that sex can be about yes um, and it is the, the heteronormative assumptions. They're worse for heterosexual women than they are for gay women because we're just outside of it. We don't even care. It has been so limiting for all of us, but those of us who managed to lift ourselves out earlier are at least free of that by the time we get to menopause. Yeah. Yeah. It's, well, I didn't expect this was coming. You know, my my late 30s, infertile, cancery, heartbreaking menopause it was really tough. It was really lonely and it was really sad because of what it meant in my life and because what I, the amount of dreams it shut down. And yeah. that's, that's cancer, not menopause per se, but it was all joined up. And this is a difficult thing to say, but I'm going to say it anyway. I've been working with a really good therapist at started out as a cancer therapist became my personal therapist for quite a while now and 
a few years back, I was talking about my infertility and the five embryos I had made that each one died in me, one after the other, and how hurtful, painful, what a loss it is. And we were talking about the loss and how I very much integrated that loss into my life. And it's, it, you know, at a point in my life, it was the worst thing that I wasn't a mother, and that's not the worst thing in my life anymore, and I'm really glad of that work. But my therapist, who never um, holds back from going pretty far, he said, to him, okay, this is going to sound clumsy, but I'm going to say it anyway. I'm glad that you lost those five embryos because it made you deeply fitted to who you are now. And I said, I agree with you. I too am glad that that happened over 20 years ago and I'm become who I am. But I would say that I'm hard glad. You know, I'm not Pollyanna glad about it. I'm not, yay, shit things happened. This is who I am today. I don't believe we have to celebrate our losses as if they are the armour that we made. Because actually I think that the value in our losses and our grief is letting go of the armour. Being as vulnerable as we, we can be now, and I think that's one of the main gifts of menopause, it's embracing our vulnerability. Um, I wrote a short story, I had a lovely commission, Virago and my publishers for my novels, and they did a great anthology last year to celebrate their 50th anniversary. It's called Furies, and it's all the words that were ever used against women. You know, whore and fury and dragon. Anyway, my, my story is dragon. And my dragon, actual dragon, visits menopausal women and spends time with them in their letting go and their ripping off the scales, the dragon scales of the armour that we build up over life to get us through. And I think menopause is a phenomenal time for letting go of that armour. It's beautiful. Yeah, it really can be. And when we fight it, which is what so many women do, they fight it because we're told to stay yep. a particular way. Yep. Then we don't reap those benefits. That's, right. that's so much part of what I do because I want women to know how powerful this time of life can be, yeah. how valuable we are. We don't lose our value as we get older. No. It, it grows. <laughs> you know, we're not going yeah. downhill. We're going uphill. Yes. You know, it's 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 an upwards trajectory, I believe, until the very end of life. Me too. And it acknowledges the value of the life we've lived. Yes. Rather than pretending it didn't happen and I'm, I'm still 25. Mm. These years, these actual physical scars, these emotional scars, they're a value. And they've been hard, bloody one. Yeah. And I, and I really, you know, there's a lot of bullshit out there about being positive about cancer and being positive about shit. I'm not talking about positive psychology. I'm talking about really giving credence and value to what we've been through and acknowledging that it gives us some, some ballast. Life is groundless. Everything is uncertain. We do not know what's going to happen. Not really. I mean, it's all a lie. We pretend we know what's going to We pretend we say goodbye to our partner in the morning and we're going to see them later. We don't know for sure. The terrible things happen all the time. Any one of us who's lost someone suddenly knows that. We do not know for sure. And we behave as if there is ground to live on. It's not. Life is groundless. It's deeply uncertain. But when we can find the value in who we've been and who we're being becoming, then we begin to provide a little ground for ourselves. Wow. <laughs> I, I'm, it's so interesting because I I'm, I'm keep glancing over at my other screen. I've got this long list of questions. I haven't asked oh, you a oh, single one. I'm so one. sorry. No, 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 no. no. It's brilliant. <laughs> it's brilliant. But I'm like looking at this and I'm thinking, I didn't need to do that, did I? No. I, spent, I spent ages preparing my questions. Um, <laughs> I haven't needed any yeah. of them. No, it's been I'm such brilliant. a wind her up and let her go person. I, I well, am. Well, that's, that's wonderful. It's just wonderful. And, you know, we've touched on all the things that yeah, I sure. wanted to touch on. You know, yeah. it's it's so powerful. And, 
you know, I'm so grateful that you have this voice. And for a time, you, you know, you, you couldn't talk to me because you were in the middle of your research. And now that's done. And we can start having these conversations. And this is just the tip of we've tip of the iceberg here. You right. know, there is so much more to dig into. But no, it's it's been brilliant. And I just I love what you're doing. So is there going to be a book out of your PhD? Um, I hope so. So at the moment, I've I've written something that I tried really hard not to make it too academic, given that I didn't come to this kind of work till I was fifty five. Um, I wanted it to be the kind of work that my siblings and you know they all left school much earlier because of poverty, not because they weren't bright, smart, and clever people. Um, I wanted it to be work that they could read if they wasn't if they wanted to. I don't think they will, but just who cares? Um, and it's only on it for seven, and they've all had full lives. I think it quite helped that I have. Well, one of my sisters died when I was young, but five sisters, four, four sisters, five who lived pretty good lives long before menopause was the biggest story in the world. My older sister is 17 years older than me. And uh, I hope, I mean, I've got my five are coming out next month, I think, the, the date's yet to be fine, Um, And it is unlikely that I would get this far and then have a two hour vibe and they go, no, this is shit, you're not passing. Um, I may have to do corrections, most people do, but that's fine. And that's just like editing. I love it and I love working with, with people to make my work better. And then after that, um, I expect to write some research, some academic papers, I don't know. But beyond that, I would love to make a much more accessible non fiction book because. The eight women I interviewed are amazing and they come from very different backgrounds and they've got very different stories, but across the board, they are excited about their future and from very different perspectives and for very different reasons. But I think there's something utterly joyous in hearing their experience about to be excited about their future. I suspect, given the publishing market, which I know pretty well, that I might need to add in eight famous women. Um, it just didn't help itself. No. <laughs> well, oh, no. Um, and because I think, I, you know, I think that, that from a psychotherapeutic point of view, I've gotten quite good at getting people's secrets out of them now. So maybe, maybe I'll find some juicy things to share. Yeah, these women that I interviewed, this one, I've, I, I turned quite a lot of their interviews into poems um, because rather than just telling the naked data that I didn't treat them as if they were human beings, I took their stunning lines that they spoke and made them into poems. And so I've got these eight poems and they're all about, you know, three or four minutes long. I mean, they'd be a gorgeous half, half hour yeah. show at the very least. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Vagina monologues for menopause. Yeah. Um, so I definitely want to do stuff with it. And I think that I spoke to such a lovely range of people that there is value in what I have to share for all sorts of people, um, which really excites me. So, yes, this year, for the first time in five years, I'm not also studying theory, reading academic papers, writing a thesis and training. So I have a little bit more spare time to do some other exciting things with my writing work. So, yeah. Brilliant. And just because I'm personally interested, how, how did you find going from being a regular writer mm, mm, to being mm. an academic writer? Because I'm all I'm doing a master's in gerontology. Oh, wow. And I started it when I was 56. I mean, yeah, I've, okay. Stop. <laughs> what, what, and it's, you it's, really have to write differently, don't you? It, it, do, it did take practice. So my first few essays I really struggled with because I didn't want to write the way they wanted me to. I know. It's such I didn't a... want to write like I know like I'm not there. it's very turgid, isn't uh -huh. it? The very turgid um, way of writing. I was <laughs> Sorry, as, <laughs> it's a psychotherapy doctorate, so I am expected to bring some of myself into it. So that's good. Oh, should, for anybody watching on YouTube, it's now done a thumbs up, which is embarrassing, and stupid. But anyway, <laughs> I, I, I won't wave my hands around, which is very hard for me. I talk with my hands. Um. Sorry. So what I ended up doing was I, I managed to get through the hoops of the academic essays. In the thesis itself, I do have quite a lot to me because I chose a methodology that let me do that. Um, and that here's two words I had literally never heard of five years ago. My methodology is hermeneutic phenomenology. 
Oh, goodness. I mean, Basically, what on earth is that? I'm trying to interpret what people said it was like. Um, but that it'd be two words I literally never heard of uh, five years ago. But what having been a writer before gave me was I wasn't scared of writing 60,000 words. That wasn't frightening at all. Yeah, I'm not worried about my dissertation. Uh, it's 15,000 words. I'm yeah. like, I, that's not I, hard. I'm scared that I wouldn't be able to get it into 60,000 and I want it to be 85, which is the mm. average length of my novels. Um, I was scared about that, but I wasn't at all worried about the extent of what I was having to write. And that really helped. And also um, on my course, there was another novelist on the course, so that really helped. We got to talk to each other about our frustrations with it. And I know that we have been encouraging to our friends in our cohort who had never written anything like that before. So I think it's a, it's definitely a crossover, you know, it's a lady leap from, from literary fiction to academia. But I think I've done, I've certainly done the best I could, and I'm really pleased with what I did. So. I have never written a novel in my life without wishing, without knowing it wasn't anywhere near as good as the original dream in my head. You know, it can't be. It just can't be. We haven't yet managed to plug in our heads into the laptop and then it just pour out. That dream of what I have in my head has to go through my body. It has to be typed. It has to be honed. It has to have post-it notes. Uh, it turns can't you dictate? <laughs> even can't so, you dictate? Even so, it's still coming through my body. It's coming through me. It changes yeah. in that process. It's not the original vision. Mm. I'm quite good at accepting that now. And what I got to with my thesis was there was one day I was um, again editing the discussion. And I burst into tears and I was sitting at my desk sobbing. And I was like, oh, okay, you're finished. Because I know when I'm writing a novel, when I burst a tear, when I cry, I'm mean, sobbing on the fi- I know it's the final edit. Really? And it's that my body really? knows it's done before my mind does. And as a yogi, as someone who's been very ill and had to work hard to come back into my body, I work very hard to trust my body. My body knows mm. what it's doing. Mm. That's another very important lesson, isn't it? Yeah, really. We have to come back for another podcast about listening to <laughs> our bodies. So, listen, I can't keep you forever, much as I'd like to. So, yes, Stella, what would you like, what would you most like women to know? Your body is your home. It's the only ground you have. Everything else will change and your body will change too. But we do not live outside of our body. Once the body's gone, we're gone. We need our bodies to survive. We need our bodies for the world to even exist. You know, when I die, the world as I know it will die because I won't be there to experience it. It'll go on without me, of course. But my experience of the world will die when my body dies. So when we center my life in my body, when I trust my body and when I believe that my body knows what it's doing instead of trying to overreach it with my mind, um, I know, however hard that often is, I know that I'm better off and I know that in the end I'm happier and more at peace with myself. Trust the body. The body knows. It really knows. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Magnificent Midlife Podcast. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe, follow and share it. Also, giving a five-star review really helps get the word out. You'll find the show notes at magnificentmidlife.com. That's also where you can get my book, Magnificent Midlife, Transform Your Middle Years, Menopause and Beyond. Make the very best of your next chapter. Help me change the world, one magnificent midlife woman at a time.